Uh, so, hi. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for having me here. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Place. I'm uh, currently based out of Tokyo, but uh, uh, work for SaltStack uh, in, uh, in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here and away, just even if briefly, from the US election. So um, this, is, uh, this is not a traditional talk. Uh, we've talked a little bit uh, today about culture. Uh, and often at uh, these sorts of events, we talk about uh, specific tools, right? We say, uh, okay, you download this tool or you buy my product, uh, and then you, know, you can go and do the, these things. Uh, this is not that. Uh, instead, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the sorts of things that we talk about uh, internally at SaltStack on our engineering team when we think about building engineer or when we think about building uh, our automation platform, in the hopes that uh, perhaps some of those principles uh, that we think about both uh, in our past engineering and in our future roadmap uh, can inform the sorts of tools that you build. Because I'm a big advocate that uh, that people should not uh, simply limit them themselves to tools that they can download. Uh, DevOps should be a practice where uh, we build uh, our own tools. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about where we've been uh, in terms of, uh, of DevOps. Um, most people, I think, associate uh, the rise of DevOps with uh, the rise of configuration management. You remember this. Uh, you know, even though configuration management is much older, uh, those, that sort of automation tool chain is, is more or less uh, aligned with, uh, with when DevOps came on the scene. And um, configuration management, and specifically DevOps today, uh, is very much oriented, I think, toward the provisioning side of things. I think uh, Mitchell really alluded to this earlier. Uh, we talk a lot about, uh, okay, how do I provision my data center? How do I provision my new app? Uh, okay, the dev side has given me this to put into production. How do I put it into production? How do I build this CI CD uh, platform? But um, that's only a piece of the ops picture, right? Um, we put stuff into production, and uh, if we get that done by breakfast, well, what do we do for the rest of the day? That's the ops job, right? Uh, because, of course, infrastructure uh, has a life cycle, right? We have to monitor it. We have to understand it. Uh, we have to be able to respond uh, to changes in the infrastructure, uh, and, uh, and we have to be able to maintain it going forward. Uh, and while I think the, the DevOps tooling that we've had up to this point, specifically configuration management, has done a really wonderful job about being able to say, okay, I'm going to declare the state of, of my infrastructure, I'm going to declare the intended state of my system, and then I'm going to push that out into the world through the means of a workflow, uh, that doesn't always speak to the piece that comes after provisioning, right? The true operational nature uh, of what our job really is. So I want to talk about the sorts of ideas uh, that might come into play when we think about that problem. Um, so <laughs> I think that um, when we think about this stuff, ultimately, one of the things that we do, especially in the age of containerization now, uh, as we begin to see things on massive scale, um, containerization is essentially, in my view, I think one nice way to, to think about it, is that uh, containerization are processes in distributed computing, right? Um, if you go back and you look at the history of distributed computing and you look at what we're trying to accomplish now in terms of modern infrastructure, I think you see a lot of parallels. And so I think that it's important uh, to, to look at the three areas of distributed computing and sort of divide the, the DevOps tool chain into what's there. Uh, the first, the ability for systems to be aware of the existence and capability uh, of member, member nodes. Uh, typically, you know, we call this something like service discovery. The ability to coordinate uh, tasks between those nodes, uh, be it uh, a scheduler or what have you. Uh, and finally, interprocess communication, which can connect almost any node in the system to any other node in the system, right? Um, it's that third piece uh, that I want to focus on uh, today. Uh, and uh, that piece is known as a message bus. Uh, a message bus uh, is something that gets used uh, all the time in uh, application design. Uh, the ability for um, these sort of large-scale applications to be able to pass messages uh, to each other. But it is not something that I think traditionally we think about all that much 
uh, from an operational perspective. And sort of one of my missions in life is to try and change that because I think uh, if we start to introduce the concept of message buses uh, into our infrastructure, what we can do is we can ultimately build uh, control planes uh, for uh, our sets of machines or our sets of containers or what have you. Uh, and I'll show you why I think that's important going forward. So in order to build a message bus, we need a couple of things. We need uh, a data model to be able to uh, describe the data which is going to be passed across this bus. Uh, we need a command set for pushing messages onto and off of this bus. Uh, and we need a messaging infrastructure, uh, some sort of transport to get these messages uh, between our machines. So let's talk about what a message bus for ops might look like. Right? If we were to build some sort of centralized system uh, for all of our machines and our infrastructure uh, to speak to each other uh, like a control plane, an automation control plane, uh, what might that be able to do? Well, it might be able to, for example, do monitoring, right? We might be able to start pushing monitoring messages across this bus uh, such that uh, one or more or many machines uh, can understand or hear about the state of other machines light bulbs should be going off at this point. Hey, that's kind of valuable, right? Because as it turns out, if my database tier has some sort of knowledge about what the health and performance of my web tier is, uh, I can begin to anticipate and I can begin to uh, react uh, to what that might look like. That's a much more flexible approach than what we've had in the past. Uh, configuration management. I work for SaltStack. SaltStack is well known as a configuration management vendor. Uh, but um, configuration management uh, connected to a message bus uh, is th kind of the message that, uh, that I like to try and push. Uh, so what happens if, for example, we can push uh, configuration management uh, information uh, across uh, this bus, right? Uh, such that uh, we can have uh, other systems uh, begin to react to what's happening in the configuration management sphere. Uh, chat ops, right? We can take what's happening uh, on a centralized message bus between systems and we can you know, begin to integrate it into uh, our you know, human workflow. Uh, the very traditional uh, message here is around uh, auto scaling, right? Uh, if uh, we have this message bus that's connecting systems together and uh, one of the properties of that message bus is uh, sort of a collective understanding of the health of the systems on that bus, uh, we can begin to scale uh, systems uh, based on what we see there. Uh, Lambda, for example, uh, at, uh, at Amazon is a good example of being able to do this. Uh, and, uh, and provisioning, right? Um, if we begin to push provisioning information uh, across this bus, uh, all of a sudden we can connect it uh, to these other sets of systems and we can uh, build uh, uh, reactive rules um, so that we know, oh, okay, if such and such uh, got provisioned, uh, make sure that chat ops is notified, uh, see if it matches any sort of auto scaling rules, uh, introduce monitoring, so on and so forth. So instead of building a system where uh, we have sets of silos. Instead, we have s a common streaming APIs uh, from which uh, all of these systems uh, can listen. So we have one river. Everybody can hear what's going on in that river. Everybody can react to that. Uh, and that is how we can build uh, what I think are going to be next generation uh, infrastructures. Uh, we also, of course, have message buses uh, for dev, right? Uh, anything that connects various layers of an application stack has a message bus of some kind. Anybody here who's an application uh, developer and develops an application that you know kind of <laughs> runs on one or more servers, right? You've developed some sort of message bus for this. Uh, most often, these are streaming. When I talk about message buses, um, one easy way to think about this is nothing more than a streaming API, right? Uh, here is uh, a bus that I can connect to, and I can listen to events as they fly past, right? Uh, sometimes, though, message buses can be um, set up or torn down on demand, right? So the question that I'm getting at uh, fundamentally is what sorts of possibilities emerge when these traditionally siloed streams of events uh, are shared with one another, right? What happens if all of a sudden uh, the monitoring uh, infrastructure, which is traditionally siloed, uh, can dip into that message bus stream 
and hear about uh, logging information as it streams past, right? Uh, what sorts of uh, things can happen if the monitoring system could hear about provisioning events and all of a sudden it can say, oh, okay, I heard about this provisioning event, I'd better add this new system, right? This gives us a model uh, that we can use instead of uh, putting all of that stuff really high up in this configuration, centralized configuration management layer. Uh, we can decouple these systems and allow these systems to or write rules for these systems based on the types of events they expect to hear on the bus. So what does automation kind of look like right now? Um, we have packaged workflows, essentially, right? Um, configuration management has been wonderful for a number of reasons, uh, but effectively what's happening is we're sort of taking a series of steps, right, and uh, we've been able to either take a declarative or a per an imperative approach, right, but most of the time, fundamentally what we mean when we talk about automation, right, is, oh, okay, I've written these series of steps, and yeah, maybe I've written them in YAML, maybe I've written them in Python, whatever, right? But at the end of the day, basically, we just have these workflows, these manifests, and then they're initiated by a human, right? And then the next time we need to do something else, we do that, and so on and so forth. Well, we should start to see a major problem here, right? Because, you know, when all of a sudden we introduced virtualization, we said, oh, okay, this is a great problem, you know, this is a great solution to this problem of scale. Well, now we're looking at containerization, right? And we're saying to ourselves, oh, well, just continuing to build all of these workflows is going to scale. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Um, so despite our best efforts, you know, these can still be very brittle. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's something to watch out for. And the thing about this is, is none of this really feels like programming, right? Um, being able to manage an infrastructure right now uh, feels very brittle. It feels like, you know, okay, well, we've managed to migrate from bash scripts to YAML. Well, that's fine. <laughs> um, but that really doesn't feel very much like programming. Why is it that uh, it's 2016 and in ops, nobody can really think about the concept of a callback, right? Like, that should be an easy thing for us to do. Uh, but <laughs> we haven't really establish that in a very simple or standardized way, right? Um, and so there's so much that we can learn from the distributed computing world uh, when it comes to operations. So now I want to take a little bit of a left turn uh, and talk about uh, event-driven programming, right? Uh, event-driven programming, it's a programming paradigm. Anybody here who's done any sort of application development, uh, specifically if, you know, God forbid, you've had to write GUIs or JavaScript or something like that, right? Uh, you know all about this, right? Uh, this idea uh, that you can uh, effectively register um, certain uh, functions, right, uh, for events uh, that happen, right? That should make sense more or less to everyone. Uh, if not, you know, uh, an arbitrary example might be, you know, oh, okay, I'm writing a GTK application, and so if a person clicks on, you know, such and such mouse button, right, I'm going to, you know, register this callback to fire, so on and so forth. So the case that I'm making is what happens if we think about that sort of event-driven model uh, that we have right now for software development, and we begin to apply that model uh, to the operational life cycle, right? Um, so yeah, I sort of mentioned, you know, I kind of throw this in because it freaks people out, right? Like, I'm not just saying, oh, let's just, you know, make an infrastructure that looks like Node.js. Uh, but, um, we have uh, a bunch of programming languages that are effective or uh, accessible uh, to the operations community, right? Uh, I'm a Python developer, so I can speak, you know, about Python, right? We have, you know, async.io, and we have, you know, Twisted, and, you know, we have Tornado now. Uh, we have really good async models uh, for doing all of this, uh, but we have very bad, we haven't done a lot to think about how we can apply these uh, to infrastructure management, right? And we can do some exciting things with that. Uh, so there are sort of three principles, right? I kind of alluded to some of them. The first is a set of functions which can handle events. Um, depending on the implementation, these can be blocking or non-blocking. A mechanism for binding these registered functions to events, uh, and a main loop, right? Uh, that basically goes through. Uh, it's async, uh, and uh, when it detects one of these events, things happen. That's effectively all that goes on. It's super simple, right? 
Uh, there are some criticisms to this, right? On one hand, you have imperative programming, this idea that you can write procedures to perform steps in a, in a particular way. And by the way, this is really funny because this has kind of a neat analog to sort of the history of the configuration management debate. Uh, on the other hand, we have declarative programming, right? Describing the intended steps of a system uh, explicitly without describing the states to achieve that data. Um, additionally, when it comes to event-driven uh, programming, right? Uh, highly asynchronous code can be difficult to debug. Anybody who's you know, been in that space knows that that's true. Um, it does take, I think, a little bit of a mind shift to think about uh, uh, imperative versus declarative approaches uh, melded into one because uh, fundamentally when you get into asynchronous event-driven programming you are crossing the streams a little bit uh, and it can be challenging to, to translate sort of these procedural workflows into something event-driven right it can be uh, a little bit difficult if we're talking about event-driven infrastructure to translate, oh, okay, here is my workflow that I have, you know, for bringing up, uh, you know, uh, Docker containers, right, uh, to something that uh, is an event-driven approach, right? When I hear such and such event off the bus, right, then respond by doing this, so on and so forth, okay? We do have some advantages, however. Um, the first is that uh, there is a natural dividing line uh, for writing, it, writing uh, unit tests, right? Uh, it's highly composable. Um, and the thing that I think is rele or relevant for us today is that um, event-driven um, programming uh, approaches uh, allow us uh, to sort of speak to this DevOps divide a little bit, right? Because if we have um, sort of a unified event bus, right, uh, and we allow applications to put data on that bus, we allow uh, our servers to put data on that bus, uh, what we can do is we can begin to speak uh, a, a common language for sort of the, the operations of an infrastructure, right? All of a sudden you can say, oh, okay, uh, apps guys, um, you uh, have this namespace in a tag, right? Um, and so you can tag your events this way, right? And ops guys, you can you know, tag your events this way, so on and so forth. And then everybody understands, oh, okay, here is sort of like this list of you know, tags, right, for events that are happening uh, on the infrastructure, right? Now I know, oh, okay, if I see one of these, this is how I'm going to react. And that's a really, I think it's a really interesting and nice way uh, to sort of bridge that divide, right? And yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, so a high-speed event bus, right, um, plus event-driven programming, we have what I like to call, uh, and many other people like to call, event-driven infrastructure. So what are the principles of event-driven information? We have events which originate from app both from applications and from systems, right? We have some sort of filter to sort these events and apply rules to them. Um, and as the rules are met, uh, register actions can occur. That's it, <laughs> right? Um, three pretty simple principles. Uh, I do like to be honest, there are some disadvantages to this. There's possible tight coupling before, uh, between the event schema uh, and consumers uh, of this schema. Uh, that can be problematic. Uh, across any sort of uh, pub sub message, uh, messaging infrastructure, you do have the possibility uh, of event loss. I come from the zero MQ world. Uh, zero MQ uh, is very explicit about the idea that uh, uh, it's completely conceivable that you're going to, uh, to lose messages uh, and that you should build uh, that sort of resiliency in, into your uh, application layer. Um, and reasoning about blocking infrastructures in this sort of approach can be a little bit tricky, but I'll show you uh, here in a moment, one way I think that we can think about, or one way that we might be able to design our way out of that. Ah, uh, and testing. Now, uh, this is a place where um, a lot of people get really concerned, right? Because, you know, when I go out and I start to talk to, these pe uh, to people about these ideas, uh, the first thing they say is, well, that's all fine and good, right? All of a sudden, you know, we have this, you know, automated infrastructure, and you're saying I can write rules, and there are going to be these events flying around, and when this this rule, you know, when I see this event happen, you know, then this rule is going to kick off, and oh my God, I can't, you know, test any of this. 
Um, and my response to that is, is basically uh, one word. I have a joke about this later on. Uh, and that's IP tables, right? Like, uh, look at IP tables. It's effectively the same problem, right? Um, OK, I've got you know, this unknown set of you know, incoming data, right? IP packets. Uh, and I want to be able to create rules and actions right, for all of those things. We can do this. We've been doing this for years, right? Uh, and the truth is, if we divide um, our domains of responsibility, we can actually test these individual pieces, uh, I think, pretty effectively. Um, we do, uh, I think we can build uh, loosely coupled systems if we're careful about it. Uh, but fundamentally, we can build uh, what really amounts to a DevOps backplane, right? A place where uh, our developers uh, can put data which they think is relevant to operations. And I think more interestingly, a place where the ops guys can put data which might be relevant to the application. And that's an enormously valuable concept, right? Because all of a sudden, you can go to your your um, app developers and say, hey, what if I could tell you, right? What if I could tell the application about the health of this, the, uh, this, the uh, systems that it's running on? What sorts of things can you do with that? I think if you go back and you do that, I think your, your, your app developers are going to be like, oh, let me tell you all of the things I can do with that. That's actually really great. Um, and uh, yeah, like I've been saying, it really allows for uh, uh, more complete lifecycle management. Um, and, you know, yada, yada, yada. OK, fine. All right, all of this is fine. How do we build one? Uh, the short story is that if you don't want to, you know, you don't have to, right? Like I mentioned at the top of this talk, uh, I spend all my time building one of these systems. It's called SaltStack. If you want to use it, it's great. But we're not going to talk about SaltStack. We're going to talk about how to take those principles and actually build an, anal an analog for that uh, for yourself, OK? Um, so, first thing you need is uh, you need events flowing onto a bus, right? Um, those are going to come from the systems which are being managed, right, and flow to a manager, right, uh, which is going to make uh, decisions about the things that should happen, right? Uh, the manager checks to see if the event matches some sort of registered handler. Uh, if so, if the event, um, uh, if the event tag matches uh, a set of rules, uh, then, uh, then we can dump it into a rules engine and we can start doing things with the data uh, that's in the event, right? And then for each set of rules that are matched, uh, some sort of action is undertaking, right? And this is an interesting connection because this is the point where we can uh, couple our configuration management system to this sort of approach, right? Configuration management is really good at going out and doing the heavy lifting, right? It's really good at, at saying, oh, okay, uh, go out and you know provision this and do this and build this and turn these services on and yada 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 right but as we've been saying it's really bad at understanding when it should do that right the only time it does that is when we tell it to do that this is about building a system uh, that can uh, perform that action without us involved so the moving pieces right um, and forgive me I haven't been tracking time so if I'm starting to run over someone please alert me um, we need an event bus transport, right? Uh, like I mentioned, I come from the Zero MQ world, but there's a whole bunch of these. The most well-known one these days is probably Kafka, right? Um, but uh, if you look for you know, uh, uh, message queues, you can find dozens and dozens and dozens in basically any language. And more or less, all the methodologies are the same, right? Um, you need some sort of telemetry, right? Um, and by that, I mean you need things which uh, generate information about uh, the health of the system that other parts of the system can react to, right? Um, you need uh, actors, right, which are uh, the things which should happen, right, or the way to make things happen in response to an event, right? Uh, and you need a reactor, right, which tells you when an action should be taken, right? Uh, so how do we build uh, an event bus? An event bus must handle security, it must handle reliability, and it must handle uh, serialization. Uh, typically, if you pick an event bus, uh, or if you pick uh, like a message queue uh, system up off the shelf, all of these things more or less will be handled for you. Um, it may handle uh, an, 
uh, easy set of interfaces for sending and receiving, right? Uh, because fundamentally, part of this principle is that we need to make it easy uh, for everybody in our infrastructure, or I'm sorry, everybody in our organization uh, to be able to send and receive information, right, on, on this bus. Both the ops guys uh, and the dev guys ought to be able to dip their toe into the stream and get the data that they need and react to it in their own way, right? Uh, and of course, you know, all of these different transports, uh, like I said, zero MQ, whatever it is, is going to have, they're all going to have support for multiple ar architecture patterns, be it, you know, pub sub or push pull or whatever it is, right? Uh, and message filtering, right? Um, typically, um, this comes into play if you're doing something really complex with this approach. Uh, in my experience, a lot of people try to implement this far too early, and it makes all of this stuff kind of hard to reason about. If it's something that you can get away with and just let everybody hear everything, um, then great. And by that, I, I don't mean every server in the data center hearing everything about every other server. Of course, there's going to be some sort of segmentation, right? But I'm talking about filtering on the bus itself uh, and routing, right? Um, so I feel like I'm uh, going too slow. Uh, message bus topology, right? Uh, typically, uh, we have uh, pub sub, right, which is to say that uh, uh, one person um, pushes information right out, right, uh, and everybody else uh, receives it, right. Um, and so most of these implementations are brokered, right, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip over this because I think I'm going too slow. Uh, we mentioned uh, all the off the shelf uh, messaging stuff. Um, Telemetry, right, the ability to uh, have events or have um, uh, various applications put uh, data onto that bus. Uh, that should be very easy for everybody in the organization. It should be very lightweight, uh, so on and so forth. When we do it in Salt Stack, we have two components to how this works, right? We have a message tag uh, and we have data, which is a dictionary of the sender's choosing. That's it, end of story, right? Those are the only rules. And that works really well for us. Uh, and so, like, here's an example of really all that it takes uh, to be able to slam a message onto a message bus in zero MQ, right? You can, you know, basically uh, dial this down to five or six lines. Uh, and the reason that I put this code up here is to demonstrate that uh, this stuff is actually incredibly simple, right? It's super simple uh, for ops guys to be able to you know, write plugins for the stuff that they need on their operating system. It's super simple uh, for your app, uh, app developers, right? So on and so forth. Um, that's it, right? It's a couple of lines. So um, here's a little joke I made when I was uh, preparing this demo, right? Um, you know, it, these rules engines uh, can be scary, um, but I really don't think they need to be. Um, all a decision engine does is uh, it registers events which occur on the bus uh, and then maps those events to actions which need to take place. Period. End of story. Right? Um, so it can be as simple or as complex as somebody wants, right? But the DevOps idea is to create a shared abstraction, right, for these rules, right? Uh, the idea that, um, okay, here's this decision engine, right, and it's, you know, ingesting events all the time, and it's, you know, uh, matching them and pushing these out, them out to these sets of rules, right? But if your ops guys need to write their sets of rules, great. If your dev guys need to write their sets of rules, great, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so, you know, for example, if you wanted to, to sort of see how that structure might look uh, in kind of like a YAML configuration file, you might write, you know, something like this, right? And this does not, by the way, correspond to any sort of existing tool, right? This is just sort of a um, uh, one sort of framework, right? You might be able to say, oh, okay, so anytime you match uh, these sorts of tag, or this tag, right? Uh, run through uh, these re uh, reactions, right? Do, which is to say, perform these actions immediately. I'll come back to register in a second. And then uh, run that event through these sets of rules, right? These sets of rules then correspond to actions, done and done. Now, let me come back uh, to a, a register. Uh, I think that if you are, want to deploy um, these sorts of ideas into uh, your own infrastructure, uh, the first thing that you do is you come along and you go, oh, okay, uh, it's really easy for me to build a transport. It's really easy for me to build uh, rules. I'm off to the races. Um, but then all of a sudden, um, 
you know, a few hours later you're going to say, hey, wait a second, I need to be able to track some sort of state between all of these things, right? Because as nice as it would be uh, to just have this entire thing be stateless, that's really just not going to happen. Um, so you need some sort of register uh, that you can allow events uh, to persist a flag or whatever it is, or persist some data in the centralized uh, register that uh, 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 forthcoming events uh, can operate against. Right. Um, an actor in this model is uh, just um, what is run as the uh, result of an event matching uh, a given rule. It could be a call to an external service, a configuration management call, code running locally, whatever. Um, so I mapped all of this out uh, into uh, you know kind of some pseudocode. Um, you know, fair warning, I did like try to restructure all of this at the last minute uh, and didn't quite finish. Uh, so I'm sure there are some bugs uh, in there somewhat. But if you want to you know take a peek at this stuff and uh, and look at at sort of like one model, it's not like a working demo, right? But it's like, oh, okay, uh, here are a couple of pieces, uh, and this is how this might operate. Uh, I put all this stuff online. So uh, to review. In order to build scalable systems, right, I believe that we need to adopt many of the lessons of distributed computing. Uh, and I believe that we can migrate from very simple hum human-initiated workflows uh, to reactive programmable systems. And I believe that this is not as hard as it sounds, right? This is actually really easy. This is not something that you know, everybody needs to do all at once, but I think as soon as you start thinking about the possibilities here, you can begin to build uh, reactive uh, elements into your existing infrastructure, uh, and it's going to save uh, all kinds of time uh, and hopefully money. And uh, finally, events, uh, event buses are pretty good. Uh, let's all build more of those. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I can uh, take questions uh, at the, the, the Q&A stuff uh, later on. Uh, so thank you very much for having me.